Okay, well, thank you all for coming. I'm Jean Smith from the New York Salon. My co-director, Alan Miller, is in the audience. We are going to be filming this session, and the way it's going to work, it's going to be an in-conversation, which means that the panelists are not going to give formal introductions. I'm going to ask them a series of questions. We're going to have some back and forth on the panel, and then we're going to bring it out to the audience. And probably about 50% of the time will be with the audience. I do want to thank the Institute of Ideas and the Battle of Ideas for inviting the New York Salon to partner you know, with them for this festival. I also want to thank the Barbican uh, you know, for hosting the event and, of course, World Bites for filming. Any of you who don't know anything about World Bites, they are filming. They're run entirely by volunteers, so I encourage you to go and check out their display after this session and make a donation. First of all, I'm going to introduce the uh, four speakers, but just to give you some background on this, this session came out of a discussion we were having about gun control and gun violence in the US following the, uh, you know, the shooting of 26 people in Sandy Hook, Newtown in Connecticut. Uh, you know, the more we thought about how we wanted the session to go, the more we, we realized that actually there are some common threads in terms of you know, various acts of violence that are happening both in Europe and in the US. And at a time when in fact violent crimes are down in the US over, overall, it, it appears that there are more of these random acts. Whether or not they are, then you know, uh, you know, we're, we're going to talk about it. So this is not going to be a strictly, are you for or are you against gun control? We want to have a much broader discussion about the whole issue of um, you know, what you might want to call lone wolf violence in, in, uh, in the US and elsewhere, and what that has to say about politics today, what it has to say about changing US society. But just before we start, I'd like to see if you could raise your hands. Um, as you know, the Second Amendment gives us, as American citizens, the right to bear arms. Who here is in favor of the right of American citizens or citizens in general to bear arms? Do we get to vote? Yes, of course. <laughs> Just so you know, I'm an impartial chair. Everyone on the panel. Uh, yeah. Okay, we've got, a, we've got a stacked panel here. <laughs> Those against? Presumably right, okay, so it's about 50-50, which is good. So I'm going to introduce the speakers, not in the audience that they're going to speak, but just in the order that uh, they are in front of me. On my far left, we have Nancy McDermott, who is an, a writer and advisor to Park Slope Parents, which is New York City's most notorious parents organization. Then next to me here, we have Dr. Kevin Yule, who's a senior lecturer in history at the University of Sunderland and author of Assisted Suicide, the Liberal Humanist Case Against Liberalization. He also wrote a phenomenal book on uh, affirmative action during the Nixon era, which I recommend that you read. Then on my far right, we have Dr. Tim Stanley, who's a, a leader writer and columnist for the Daily Telegraph. And um, he also has a, a very good book that you should read on, uh, well, not that you have to read, but I encourage you to read it because it will be good for you, uh, on Pat Buchanan. And then immediately to my right, we have Christine Rosen, who is a fellow of the New America Foundation and a senior editor for New Atlantis. So if you could all just welcome the panelists, that would be great. <laughs> so what we're going to look at during this session is um, you know, to look at these so-called lone wolf shootings and, um, you, you know, as I said, look at what they represent. But we also want to look at the state's response to these shootings and the media response. And then I'm hoping, we only have a, you know, we don't have a lot of time, but that we can end on a positive note in terms of how we, we should, you know, respond to these things. Um, but first of all, I'm going to take Christine Rosen. Uh, and I guess the, you know, my first question to the, to the panel is over the past 20 years, it does appear that in the US, violent crime is down and violent uh, crimes, you know, uh, what you would call homicides, murder, are also down. So, uh, you know, my question is, in, in relation to these random acts of violence, um, what do they represent? Um, do they have something in common? You know, you look at the, uh, the, 
Boston uh, bombings, you look at the, uh, you know, the shootings in Sandy Hook and Aurora, you look at, I know here in, um, in the UK, you had the Woolwich uh, knife attack, what these things, uh, you know, represent, and do they have anything in, in common. And the thing that I think is quite interesting, although now I've said this, it's probably all going to change, is they do seem to be carried out by young males. And not young males that were living on the breadline. They tend to be young males who, um, you know, it, it's not that they're affluent, but they are, uh, you know, they clear, clearly have um, several options available to them in terms of their, their life pattern. So first, Christine, over to you. All right, to this question of risk, which is what we're talking about with mass shootings, it's true, uh, violent crime has gone down in the United States, yet our perceived risk of being attacked, whether it's by a terrorist or by a lone wolf, wolf gunman, seems to have risen. Now, um, I would say in a highly individualistic culture like we have in the US, um, this is to be expected. The media exacerbates this situation by, for example, nonstop news coverage, um, very sensationalistic uh, whenever anything like this occurs. I don't think that we can make a, a sustained argument that there is some uh, cultural milieu that's producing these, these violent young men. Cultures across uh, history and time have produced violent young men. What's the, the anthropologists have the great phrase that we've risen from apes, not descended from angels. So I think we have to talk a little bit about isolation and loneliness um, in the American context to understand what motivates some of these killers. I think we also have to understand the context of how mental illness is, is dealt with in the American context to understand this. And then there's a debate about access to guns as well. So if we're trying to find a common theme, I would say it's, it's Americans' hyper-individualism, indi hyper our, our absolute intolerance for risk. I was reminded of this um, when I had a pizza delivered to my home not long ago. And on the pizza, all around the side were all these warnings that I not burn myself to death by touching the box when it was still too hot. I mean, we have this, this extremely litigious, um, risk-averse culture. Um, and I think that really plays a lot into how we cope when you have an unpredictable, uh, violent person who attacks and kills others. Thank you. Nancy, do you agree with that? I agree with some of it, but to me, um, I think it's important to be specific about the United States now. And what, uh, what interests me, and I think there are, th this is common to, to other societies too, but um, particularly in the States, is that I, I really do feel like American society is in crisis. Um, uh, and any, or, and certainly in flux, um, uh, with decline um, and with a kind of loss of legitimacy of political institutions, and you know, and even you know, the decline of institutions like the family. There's a whole sort of, there are a whole number of things you can point to. Um, but what interests me is that um, every society in crisis has a sort of social script um, that. Uh, people adopt when they have an outburst. And I, and I think any society in crisis will have an outburst. And it seems to me that these, uh, these shootings may have more in common with something like the Salem witch hysteria um, than, uh, than anything to do specifically with young men um, and certainly to do with masculinity because this is something that you hear a lot is that this is a problem of white masculinity. Um, and so I... I, I think the, the question for me is more, um, what is it about this time and this place that means that the outbursts that people have um, are so incredibly nihilistic um, and individualistic um, as opposed to, say, uh, you know, a more collective response, a more political response? Okay, what do you think, Tim? I really like that idea of there being a social script that people conform to. You can talk, and this is a very glib and horrible phrase to use, but you can talk about fashions when it comes to violence. The most appalling attack on a school in American history was actually in 1927, and it wasn't using a gun, it was using explosives. So that was the fashion then. There's barely any of these kinds of attacks in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and then suddenly in the 80s, there's the emergence of something that people called going postal. Uh, which is based upon a postal worker who just sort of got laid off, went mad, started shooting loads of people. But the target was not schools. It was really in the 1990s and noughties that suddenly people started to turn their aggression on schools. So I think there's a case to be made that, um, that these sort of things have a trend 
And when people lose their patience and when people become very angry that they adopt a social script, I think it's a very useful way of looking at it. Uh, for me, there are, two, there are two big themes when it comes to lone wolf shootings in the US, and I may also include uh, the use of explosives as well. Uh, the first one is the important role of mental health. Uh, we have to be very honest about this, and people just aren't. Uh, there have been, I think, 64 um, single-person shootings since 1982. Of that, there was an excellent Mother Jones uh, study of this, which concluded that about half were carried out by people with severe uh, mental anxiety, psychological problems, people who had been known to be ill. Uh, given that whenever someone uh, does something violent, it tends to be on their first psychiatric episode, not many down the road, it's quite possible that many of the other people who carried out shootings also had some kind of fit or seizure. It's just that they weren't diagnosed as being ill before that happened. Um, in a number of tragic cases, uh, the state attempted to actually isolate some of the killers, uh, but because of politically correct, correct legislation, they weren't able to do so. And a good example of that is the Virginia Tech massacre. Another example might be the attempts by Adam Lanz's mother to have him instituted, which he resisted, and that may have been a motivation for his uh, decision to go and shoot people at her school. So we have to talk honestly about America's failures when it comes to mental health. The second big theme uh, is a kind of fake pop politicization of violence. Uh, that increasingly when people act out, when, increasingly when people decide to take people with them, they dress it up as a political statement. Um, the most obvious example of that in Europe is Brevik, but it's very common in the United States. Often people produce manifestos. Now, it's not a particular kind of politics, not necessarily a left-wing one or a right-wing one, but it's an attempt not just to go out, but to go out and take people with you and to go out making a statement about your society of which the most classic example is the Columbine Massacre, which was actually modeled on Timothy McVeigh's Oklahoma bombing. The Columbine Massacre was done with guns, but they actually intended to end in a spectacular explosion, uh, which they hoped would be even bigger than the one that happened at Oklahoma. And it was essentially a political act. Of course, it's a juvenile kind of politics, but that's what's interesting is this combination of the very important role of mental health, but also this, to, at this point in history, very unique American thing of trying to turn your own personal rage into a broader political statement. What do you think about this, Kevin? Because uh, Tim seems to be saying that there's two things going on. On the one hand, uh, a, lo a lot of these people have mental health issues uh, that should have been identified earlier. On the other hand, you know, some of them have various you know, political causes, and obviously we're in favour of people having, uh, feeling strongly about political causes, but, but that this is a particular response to people's political um, frustration in terms of what's going on? Well, I agree and I disagree with, with uh, what, what Tim has said. I think, first of all, uh, the example that he uses, the, the, the one 1927, was one I was going to use, just to show that there have been constantly, throughout American history, violent incidents where there are mass shootings, mass killings. And what my emphasis would be is what sort of meaning do we place on those actions at the time? As Tim talked about in 1927, the dynamiting of a school took place because uh, the school's accountant, as I recall, uh, was not very happy with the situation with the management and uh, killed uh, this, a huge amount of school children um, all at once. Uh, but we've had examples of these throughout history. And I think what's happened recently is that we're putting on more meaning. We're trying to invest meaning into those. And this is where I would disagree with Tim, is that I think mental health is one of those. I, I think particularly um, on the last uh, school shooting, there was two discussions, two separate discussions. One was about um, do we restrict access to weapons, and the other was from a mental health perspective. And yes, I do believe there are mental health issues involved, but I, I, I also think that there's this propensity to, to place a, a campaign on top of, of a tragedy that has very, very little meaning in itself. And it's just a, a sort of blank, and you, you put in whatever agenda that y you actually want to do. And I think that's what's uh, happened, and particularly, I noticed that with, with the Connecticut shootings. Um, it's, it happens almost every time from a gun control perspective, and every shooting uh, you, you get, you have Mayor Bloomberg uh, before uh, the bodies are cold, so to speak, coming out and, and uh, having this great diatribe against guns and how gun violence 
infects America. But it's happened in the, recently, particularly I think the NRA brought up the mental health issue, and that it was almost like a response was to say, well, look, the real issues are mental health. And I'm not sure that they're, they are any more than they were uh, 50 or 100 years ago. What do you think about this, uh, Christine? Because Nancy is saying that we need a, you know, a, a, a social script, and we have this issue in terms of mental illness, um, you know, political response. I was a child of the 70s and 80s when, you know, we were very, very political in the sense of not that I'm not political now, but out on the streets um, protesting. And there were, a, uh, but there were other organisations that resorted to violence. You know, the things that come to mind are organizations like the Palestine Liberation uh, um, uh, Organization, the ANC in South Africa, the IRA in Ireland. Um, you know, these were all um, uh, organizations that used violence as a tactic and in some cases as a strategy. So do you think it's, do you, think it's uh, you know, there's, there's uh, you know, what's changed? Are there any parallels we can, we can draw here? What do you think the balance is between the political and, and the mental health? I think we have both and. I mean, we still have organized uh, groups across the globe who use violence to get a message across. I mean, there's one called Al-Qaeda, last I heard. Um, so I think that we still have that. But I think, to get back to the mental health point, I do think that we see uh, cultural differences in how mental health issues or violent, isolated tendencies, how they express themselves. So think think uh, the recent Navy Yard shooter who, who had a great deal of paranoia, right? He scratched stuff into the weapon that he used, and he was clearly unwell, mentally unstable. So in the 70s and 80s, people with this sort of, you know, violent paranoia believed that the government or some horrible agency had put a bug in their, in their fillings, you know, so they were being tracked by their fillings. In the 90s, in 1990s, early 21st century, it became computer chips. Someone's put a chip in my head. Now you are starting to see people with this condition present and say, they're filming me. They're watching my every move. So in each of those cases, we do see a cultural shift in how the paranoia expresses itself. How the, and now the violence erupts and people are killed as a result of this, but I don't think we want to be too sanguine about how our environment and our cultural circumstances play into how these problems express themselves. I do think that's a separate issue from people who use um, violence and, and you know, terrorist organizations and other groups that use violence to advance a political message. I think oftentimes the manifestos that, that are found after a lone wolf shooting, for example, are expressing a kind of paranoia, isolation, and loneliness that is that I, I, I think I understood Tim's use of sort of political in a different way than we've picked up on it. I think yes, he was yes, meaning it, in yeah. he meant that in a slightly different way. Yeah. So I think we have, those are two separate things, both of which are worthy for discussion in terms of how American culture has changed. So uh, Nancy, coming back to your social script, uh, can we explore a little bit about what these things represent in terms of you know, things that have changed in the US? I think we should be clear that these are in no way political acts. They are a profoundly anti-political acts. Um, and so, I mean, I guess the question you have to ask is, you know, why, um, why do these out, why are these outbursts so anti-political? The overwhelming uh, sense I get of the United States now is just um, how incredibly divided it is. I think you could divide it, you could argue that the states is more divided um, than it has been uh, since maybe even the Civil War. It, it's interesting that you mentioned <coughs> mental health because I think what has happened is that you have a s section of American society, the, the elite section of American society, who are saying, well, this is about mental health. But they mean that in that anyone who would want to have, they don't just mean it in the sense of individual mentally ill people, but um, it, it's become common to portray people who disagree with you politically as mentally ill in some way. After uh, Newtown, uh, there was some discussion about uh, the importance of the Second Amendment as a democratic right. And the interesting thing was that uh, liberals who were coming back against that and arguing against it were saying, you know, you are, that was, they're saying you are crazy if you think that you need these arms. Um, to defend democracy. And not only crazy, the phrase now is batshit crazy, which is just a way of kind of shutting down discussion. And I think that, you know, when you have a climate like that, I don't want to say it's the cause of these things, 
but I do think that that kind of lack of a, an open atmosphere where you know we treat one another with dignity um, can I, I think that that must contribute in some way. So, Kevin, when Nancy said that she thought these were anti-political acts, you were nodding your head, so... I completely agree with the point that Tim made before, that investing, you know, to somebody, somebody who, who commits one of these atrocities and then presents a piece of paper saying, I am doing this for such and such, we don't need to believe that. It's sort of justificatory track. I, I do think most of them are mentally ill and that they are doing this, but they might have some, some sort of little piece of paper and say, oh, yes... Uh, this is this is for this particular uh, point, but I don't think I think they are, as Nancy says, anti-political acts in some ways. I think most of them are, do have a degree of mental illness. I'm not saying that there's, there's no mental illness involved. What I'm saying is that these things are not as new as we we'd, we'd uh, like to think. And my point is really that uh, it's not so much that there's a, a, a decipherable pattern of the last 20 years or so. It's more in our reaction to these things. And I think about, there was a clock tower shooting in, at, at the University of Texas in 1966. And it's very instructive to look at the reaction to that versus the reaction today. Today, they inspire huge amounts of hand-wringing discussions uh, when you have a shooting happening in, a, in, in you know, a very unfortunate, tragic shooting happening. It, it creates all sorts of discussion. It didn't in 1966, so I think when we're looking at these events, we're looking at how we respond to them. That I think that's the most interesting aspect. I really don't care what sort of cause somebody is actually saying that they're doing. I think the Columbine uh, idea very much supports that. They sort of invented a cause, as far as I can see. If, if, if there was anything, uh, uh, then it was a very childish one. Uh, equally, you, you know, the Batman killing, uh, I don't see that there's a decipherable meaning to that act whatsoever. I do think, as Nancy says, it's, it's just entirely nihilistic. Yeah, I, I, I'm pleased that it kind of got clarified there because I was worried I'd taken us down a cul-de-sac with this point about politics. Uh, what I was trying to do was to simply find things that are in common with these people. By the way, I do think it's significant that none of them are women. I think, and none of them are, have been women, right? Okay, so that, that must be... No, that can something we've we had can, serial killers. We, we've had serial killers. killers. We've not had... Women don't do this. Killers. I do think it's interesting. Uh, but if you do look across all, all of them, I mean, what... Uh, there are two things that really do stand out. One is the history of mental health, and one is this attempt to come up with a rationalization for what they're doing. So by that, I mean that they have a politics, not in the sense that it is a legitimate politics, but in the sense that when you do something utterly irrational, it's perfectly normal and human to try and rationalize it. And one way to do that is to go online, and I do think the internet is something we haven't mentioned yet, which is something significant, and you try and find a politics to create for yourself. Now, having done that, I also agree with Kevin that what then happens, because the way I see it fundamentally is there are mad, bad people. People go mad, they are bad, they do terrible things, and then what society does is it tries to itself then rationalize what they're doing. And then you get everyone jump upon those incidents and try and find meaning. And that's when, for the rest of us, it can get dangerous and have grave social consequences. After Columbine, uh, the left, of course, pushed very, very hard for gun control. But likewise, there was an attempt by the right to um, pass a law saying that the Ten Commandments had to be put up in classrooms. Why? What an earth difference would that make? If you're alone with a gun, you're not going to suddenly look at the Ten Commandments on the wall, pause, and think, no, you're right, I really shouldn't be doing this. <laughs> so so, what, so I'm, not, I'm not endorsing one interpretation of what causes this or another. For me... I think people go bad, they then try and rationalize it. What is then very interesting is how society then tries to rationalize it and then pass legislation on the basis of it. And I think that has potentially dangerous consequences. I do want us to move on to the whole issue of, of gun control and uh, the right of American citizens to, uh, to, to bear arms. Because I think it's not a straightforward, yes, I'm for gun control, um, um, uh, you know, uh, no, I'm against it. Because, in fact, when you look at the, the debate about gun control, one of the things that strikes me is that people often support their right to, to bear arms. So 80% of people who own guns support things like background checks, uh, you know, before people can 
um, you know, can, uh, can, can buy, fi buy uh, firearms. Uh, but the question I want to ask the panel is, it's very common for people to say that there's a culture of gun violence in the US. You know, they look at my favorite programs, The Rifleman, um, and, uh, and various other things to do with, um, you know, uh, Hollywood creations, if you like, of American history. And they say, well, the, you know, the, the fact is America is more violent and it's because it's much easier to kill somebody if you have a, if you have a gun. So um, I'm, going to, I'm going to start with Christine again. Okay, I'm gonna give the most ambiguous answer. L let me start out by saying I was raised in the Deep South hunting with my dad and granddad, so I know how to operate a gun. I know I've shot them many times. All, everyone in my family is a responsible gun owner, men and women, so there is my kind of caveat. Um, now as to the question of culture of gun violence, let's see if I can find it, I brought this Oh yeah, a couple days before I got on a plane, the New York Times had a piece about rally at the Alamo will call on Texans to raise their rifles high. Now this, is, this was intriguing to me because I'm, I believe in the Second Amendment. I also believe that we have, there's no reason for a law-abiding citizen to own an assault rifle. I think we can keep that in the hands of our you know, SWAT teams and our military and that would, I would be just fine with that. So I do fall into that more ambiguous uh, American who thinks, there are most people who own guns in the country are responsible gun owners. There should be background checks. We don't need assault rifles. However, I do think that people have a right to own a gun. They have a right to carry it. Members of my family have conceal and carry permits and use them. Um, some of whom are women who live alone in rural areas and feel they need it for protection. So there are legitimate reasons to own guns. And I have, I was telling Tim that I've spent the last couple of days um, talking to people here at the Battle of Ideas, sort of throwing that idea out there. And if you're British, you started yelling at me, which I think is perfectly reasonable, but, but it usually started with what you were saying earlier. Are you insane? You can't defend that, that's insane. And so I do think it's interesting when Americans try to have a gun culture debate in a foreign country, it's, it's a non-starter in some ways, because we are so farly extreme in the view of, of you know, the rest of Europe, for example. A culture, I do think we have a culture. I think it's largely law abiding. I think people have weapons because they feel they need it for protection. We have a history of, of, of allowing weapons. So I think when we're talking about present day America, we need to think very clearly about um, the kinds of bans on ammunition and assault style weapons that have largely been used in many, in many of these mass shootings. However, saying that, even if we absolutely refuse to allow another person in the United States to buy a, a gun tomorrow, there would still be so many guns in the country that we'd still have to deal with these questions of safety and use and, and whatnot. So. Kevin, you've written extensively on this topic, so uh, what's your view on this? Well, I mean, I think there is a culture of owning guns in the United States and Canada for that. that that's where I grew up, just to... Uh, confession. I, to another confess. confession. Confess your I gun use. <laughs> I grew up in a house with five guns at, at all times, as far as I can remember, in Canada, uh, slightly different than, than the United States. But there was, basically we had guns because we used them as tools. That's what we had guns in our house for. We didn't have guns for protection. And I'm, I'm not convinced that guns are, are particularly necessary for protection. I don't own a gun now. Uh, I don't feel I need one, and I've never been in a situation where I would have shot to death a human being. Uh, I, I don't think that, you know, uh, the guns for protection, I think the National Rifle Association pushes that point uh, far too hard. Um, I, I'm not sure uh, that's, a, but, but anyway, on a cultural issue, yes, there, there is a culture of owning weapons, but I don't think that there is a gun culture in the way that it's discussed. And it's interesting, the whole discussion, the, the whole gun culture discussion emerged from one article written by Richard Hofstadter in 1971 which was called America's Gun Culture. Nobody had talked about gun culture before that, despite the fact that the period just before Hofstadter was writing was the highest per capita gun ownership up until then, despite the fact that you had a history of cowboys, you know, the legacy of the cowboys coming out of the, the uh, 20s and 30s, really, uh, but you had that whole celebration of cowboys and everything else like that. So I think the gun culture discussion happened as a reaction of liberals uh, in, the, in 1971 and, and onwards. Uh, and this is really where the growth of the gun control movement um, took place. And uh, so I think, I would argue that there's not really a gun culture in the way that most people talk about it. A culture of owning guns, yes, and, and uh, a gun culture, no. 
what there is is, is also, and, and the other thing not to, to forget is that this country had a, a culture of people owning guns up until 1870, any man, woman, child, or crazy person could go freely into a, a gun shop and purchase a weapon. Uh, there's a history in Britain of freedom to own weapons. Uh, don't forget that Protestants were granted the, the uh, right to bear arms um, in, at the time of the Glorious Revolution. So people forget that. There's this, this great idea that you know, it, it never comes out in, in uh, people forget that, that Britain actually had a gun culture, if you want to call it that up until 1870. Uh, so I, I think what there is in the United States is a culture of freedom, which I think is, is embodied in the Second Amendment and the rest of the Constitution, and I think is something to which the rest of the world should aspire. So Nancy, I know that uh, you've spoken a little bit about America being divided. Do you think the have a gun, not have a gun is part of that conversation? And Kevin's saying that um, the whole issue of gun ownership is connected to freedom in the US. Would you agree with that? Well, um, can I just, I want to come back on something that, um, that Kevin said before, because I, I do think there's a gun culture. Um, it's very much like the doll culture um, and the bike culture, um, because for the first time really in American history, guns are not tools. Guns are um, a ledger activity. And um, uh, I think you could argue that a large proportion of gun ownership is, is a leisure activity. And so, you know, um, uh, I know, and in fact, there are women who are in, in really enthusiastic about guns um, and, you know, think they're really fun. You know, it's fun to shoot them and that feeling of power. And so I think, I think there, is a, there is a kind of an enthusiast culture. But the, 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 the real question of culture uh, in this discussion is the culture war. Um, and I think that what, um, what has happened is that um, I, I think that it's being portrayed as if, uh, as, as if uh, the gun culture is the problem. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, but what, what this really is, is it's a way of having yet another go at huge swathes of the country um, that uh, are I suppose, um, who, who the American elite kind of define themselves against, um, if that makes any sense. Does that make sense? Yes. Tim, some people do say, well, we don't need guns anymore in the US because yeah. uh, this is not the time of the American Revolution. Well, some wacky people do say that, yes. Um, I, I could give an ambiguous answer, but I won't. I'll just go for a straightforward one. Should there be gun control of the variety which is proposed at the moment in the US? The answer is no, um, for three simple reasons. First, political. It's almost impossible to do. America has a constitutional right to bear arms. Very, very, very difficult to overcome that. And that's been proven by the fact that earlier during this year, uh, the president supported a bill going through the Senate which was incredibly minor, incredibly small in its attempts to control access to guns. And he couldn't get the votes for it, even after a terrible, terrible shooting in a school. So, and you're going up against the National Rifle Association as well. This is something that's politically just simply kind of off the table. It's almost impossible to do. So politically, can't do it. Uh, second, it's impractical. Um, if you were to try and ban whole classes of guns, well, that would mean that innocent people wouldn't have access to them anymore, but boy, <coughs> criminals sure would, uh, because those guns are already out there. Can't get rid of them. So criminals was, would continue to have those guns and would continue to use them, but now you would have taken away innocent people's right to defend themselves. And Washington, D.C. is a classic example of that. It's almost impossible to get a gun in Washington, D.C., but believe me, somehow the drug dealers do. Um, so that's political reasons, practical reasons, and thirdly and finally, intellectually, uh, it's something America shouldn't do. Because, it's, because gun ownership is kind of at the center of the American tradition and the American philosophy and way of life. Um, it's about, first of all, resistance to the state. As long as people can defend themselves, arm themselves and defend themselves, they cannot be oppressed by the state. They are able to resist it. Uh, in the 1960s, a, a large number of civil rights activists were members of gun clubs. Uh, a lot of civil rights activists were members of the National Rifle Association. Why? Because they wanted to have guns in order to defend themselves against the local KKK, because it was something that the local racist police force refused to do. And also, it's not just about resistance to the state, it's also about self-reliance. If you have a gun, you don't need the local police force. You can defend your own property. 
It's about rugged individualism and the individualism looking after themselves and their own family. So for those reasons, practical, political, and intellectual, I just don't see this as a debate which Americans are prepared to engage in. And given their own tradition and history and culture, I don't see why they should have to. OK, so. Um... Thank you for that. So just before I come out to the audience, I do want us to look at the response because one of the things that um, you know the panelists have been saying is that the key things that's changed, and you may or may not agree with this, and we can explore this more in the discussion, but one of the key things that's changed is our response to these acts of violence, particularly in relation to the state. Um, you'll all remember that after the Boston bombings, Boston was completely locked down for 24 hours. Interestingly enough, they only found the bad guy after they unlocked the city. He was found by a member of the public. Um, and, uh, and secondly, the response of the media to these types of events. Can I just come back on something that was, was said before, though? Yes, of yes. course you can. I, I take the points that, that Nancy and, and Tim have made. I think my objection to gun culture is when it's used to sort of talk about it in a negative way which it often is, and this is, that has only, the phrase gun culture is normally brought up mm -hmm. uh, amongst liberals to, to sort of uh, castigate the gun culture and, and say what a terrible thing this is to have. Whereas I think the way uh, Tim spoke about it uh, is, is absolutely right in the political sense, certainly. Uh, just on the, the assault weapons issue, because I think that's a kind of an interesting one, because I disagree yeah. with you really about assault weapons. I think. The way to think about assault weapons is that they are they're a normal deer rifle with a go faster stripe on the side of it. That's essentially what it is. It's, it's entirely cosmetic, the difference between a, a rifle and an assault rifle. Second, it's worth keeping in mind that rifles in general are responsible for in the hundreds of casualty of, of deaths per year uh, compared to the approximately 9,000 homicides that there, there are. Uh, any kind of rifle are, are responsible for a very, very tiny percentage of all of the deaths. So it's, it's I think the, the sort of attack on assault rifles kind of goes in with this whole cultural aspect. It, we're going to attack the culture because we, what everybody doesn't want is these guys that dress up in green khaki and go out at the weekend and shoot at a bunch of targets that look like Al-Qaeda or whoever. Um, that's the, the sort of attack on assault rifles and it's an attack on these people. It's worth remembering that out of every weapon in the United States, uh, you know, estimates between 200 and, and 250 million, uh, we're, we're talking about less than uh, a half of 1% that are ever used in the commission of a crime. And don't forget that walking into an airport with a weapon that you've forgotten that you have is, is of course, coming into the crime, uh, coming into the realms of crime. So whatever people want to use these assault weapons or whatever for, is absolutely all right so long as they don't hurt other people with them. That's the whole point, is that y you should be allowed to keep something and own it and do whatever you like with it. I mean, I, as I've written about it in Spiked, I, I don't have a great understanding of people who own horses. Um, they seem to me, from the last century, uh, no longer necessary in any p potential way, not part of modern life. But, um, you know, I would allow people to, to go horse riding if they really want to because they don't hurt anybody else with it. It's similarly if somebody wants to dress up in green cocky and go into the woods and shout all sorts of things and, and, and play, play guns and, and shoot into the ground or whatever they want to do, so long as they don't hurt anybody else, I don't see that we can object to that. And, and I quite like that, that, that principle, that, that, that sort of J.S. Mills principle, um, so long as we don't do harm to other people, uh, it's all fine. So, uh, yes, the, the assault weapons don't bother me, although I have to say, if, if, you, if I had to face somebody with an assault rifle and I had a, our deer rifle with a nice scope on it, uh, I would, I would uh, be much happier with a deer rifle uh, than the assault wep weapon because they're not, they're not any more useful than a deer rifle, and, in fact, with a scope on, I'd have an advantage. Do you want to say anything about that, Christine? Just, just one thing. I, I think I think we're I. We're going to let the thing about not understanding horse riding go. We're, we're just going to pretend that go. didn't happen. We're just that didn't happen. Um, <laughs> um, but the point the point is important. I think that um, going back to what Nancy said a little earlier about the culture war, the assault weapons ban and discussion of assault weapons is actually. A, a, cover for what we're really talking about here, which, was, which is an elite, a coastal elite in most cases, 
who think no one should have a gun because why would you need a gun? It's just like they think we should all drive a Prius. I mean, I'm sorry, it's just not gonna happen, but the wish is very much there. And I, you know, let's, a huge issue in one of the recent political campaigns in the US was the fact that our current president was caught saying, these people cling to guns and religion. And by these people, he meant people like me and my family and lots, you know, half of the country. More this is that. a very polarized nation, yes. But our elite class is, which which does have access to and more media outlets in some cases than than the non-elite. It certainly has vast shores of wealth. Um, there is an attitude about people who would even want to own guns. That is what we're getting at when we're looking at assault weapons bans and things like that. So I do think that, that that cultural point is is important to understand and just the animosity that that created in law-abiding American citizens who've never harmed anyone with a gun mm. to hear their president call them those people who cling to guns and religion was deeply offensive. I, I just, I think that the thing, I, the thing that su surprises me about um, these is incidents is, is really how politicized they are. Um, and how anybody with an agenda is, re is ready to kind of project it onto these incidents. So, um, so you almost get the sense that there is a, well, I mean, there is, there is a section of society that is, is almost like just waiting for something to happen and to say, well, see, now do you see? Now, do you see? We have to get rid of these guns. On the other hand, there are other sections of society, feminists, who think that this is all about masculinity. In addition to these indisputably important topics, we need to talk about this country's twisted vision of masculinity. So this you know, becomes something that you can project um, a feminist interpretation on. And, and I think that you know, it's, it's very difficult because it makes it difficult to really have a rational assessment of these uh, events. There's a rush to judgment. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and unfortunately, um, it means it's very difficult to talk talk about it. Um, I mean, I, there are people I cannot talk to about this issue, you know, in a, in a neutral way in the States because it is just so polarized and so emotional. Um, it's very difficult to, um, to have a rational discussion now. Yeah, in, in terms of the state response, that does move us on to a different area. I, when it comes to dealing with uh, this usual lone wolf single person shootings, there's absolutely nothing we can do, nothing we can predict, and nothing the state can probably preempt. On the other hand, you mentioned Boston. And that's taking us into a slightly different debate, which is the question of terrorism, uh, which first of all raises the, the issue of how one actually defines terrorism. Were those people truly terrorists in the sense of, be, of being part of a political movement, of having an agenda that is not legitimate, but one which is sort of recognized by many different players? Can we really call them that, or do we just call them juvenile criminals? And of course, part of the problem with, with the war on terror is that there is such a thin line between simple criminality and actual political terror. However, because there is an element of politics behind it, that sort of empowers the state to get into preemption, as in gathering an intelligence to, to sort of preempt these things from happening, and also responding in either a military or a uh, secret services kind of way. And that's where things get potentially, again, troubling. I'm always reluctant to grant the state any power to expand beyond, it, beyond what it currently has. Bureaucracy is a little like a cancer that will instinctively grow. That's what it exists to do, and you have to keep constant checks on it. And quite often there can be a, a reaction. I, I want to say overreaction, because when people have died, it's impossible to think of how a state can overreact. But there is often a reaction that results in the creation of a new form of terror, and that is in the form of the state. Not that I'm saying that the recent revelations about the NSA, the Edward Snowden stuff, I'm not saying that that's a form of political terror, but it is certainly uh, an expression, an articulation of a government that has taken an opportunity to expand and has taken that opportunity and really, really run with it. Uh, so when it comes to talking about those single acts of terrorism, we as a public and we as a demos have to be very... We have to be very vocal about what we think government can and cannot do. We have to keep an eye on the people and how they respond. We must not allow the media to push them too far because the media is there to sell papers or to get hits on websites. Therefore, it is there to play up the aspect of risk. We have to be very careful that we don't emerge from a terrible situation uh, straight into another situation which in many ways is equally terrible. Really, when it comes to political violence, terrorism and state power are sort of like two jaws of the same trap, and they work together. 
Right, I'm going to bring it out to the audience now. I know there are other things that the panellists want to say, um, but I do want to bring the audience in. So just to engage with what Tim said about the, the three reasons, so political, practical and, um, and intellectual. Um, I've got to say that the, the political and practical reasons don't really hold that much weight because if we, if we didn't ever do anything that was politically difficult and a challenge, then we'd still have slavery and women wouldn't have a vote. Um, so to, to look at the intellectual issue, I also kind of put that in the same category as the we had guns in 1870 argument because that's completely absurd because look at what else we had in 1870 um, that we now don't have any more or have gained since then. Um, like horses. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Horses are eternal. <laughs> um, so, so the intellectual um, comment, I just, I just kind of wanted to build on that a little bit more. So with the, could you just give me a little bit more on the rugged individualism and, and what you actually really think the value of the, the intellectual argument is? It is obviously a polarised uh, issue, and, and I suppose just to make the point that everyone on the, on the panel is... is uh, in, in favour of bearing arms, so that there's a lack of uh, balance in, in that regard, just to make that point. And, and secondly, it's been noted that um, people try and <clears throat> find meaning uh, as a result of uh, when, when these incidents happen, and, and I think, Kevin, you're, you're making the point that it, it shouldn't be about gun control. I think you're also saying it shouldn't be about mental illness. So I'd, I'd put it to you that is the best reaction when these things happen just to say, well, shit happens. Well, I'm an American. I shoot straight. I lived in Austin, where the belt, where the watchtower shootings took place, and most recently I lived in San Antonio, where that article was published. Like two of the panelists, I uh, I lived in Alaska, above the Arctic Circle, <coughs> and guns were a tool, like a fishing pole. So my attitude about guns was very different, and kids. My son at 12 knew how to use a gun. And I also agree, I think, I think you really articulated some of the underlying things. I've never heard anybody say, uh, talk about uh, Americans having, uh, feeling like that at some point they might need to go up against the government and not wanting to give their guns up. And that, I mean, there, there's definitely that frontier attitude. And especially when you live in Alaska or Texas, it's definitely there. Um, but one of the areas where I disagree is there is a gun culture. And um, in the south side of San Antonio, there is an outlaw culture, a major outlaw culture, and you don't bring a knife to a gunfight. And there's a whole, the, the, the guns are arming the cartels in Mexico. And I live, what, two hours, two and a half hours away from from um, Mexico, so, and I feel the same way about assault rifles, but what I did like about this panel is it's so polarized in the United States and definitely polarized here, is there's a, there's a nuanced argument about why Americans are like it, like, think like we do, and, and the gun is a tool, and just, I just appreciate it so much because it's so polarized. Uh. I'll go back to the argument of the lone wolf, and some people mentioned that they're making a statement, even a crazy statement. But my question is, maybe they're not making a statement, and could it be that they ask, actually they're asking for recognition? Because for me, recognition is a very, very problematic term. Right? We see, for example, many political movements or everything that has to do with identity politics asking for recognition. Not asking for more, not asking for a better condition, but recognition, see us, we are here. For example, the Zapatistas had as their main motto, we put on our balaclava so you can see us. And this, I think, if you, if you stretch the bit too much, it becomes like the child which is making too much noise so as to attract attention. So in a society that we consider that, you know, it's this idea of self-entitlement that, listen to me, I also have something to say. Could we say, could we think that the lone wolf is actually this false idea of central entitlement going mental? I just want to ask, what is it that means it happens in America, and it doesn't happen nearly as much anywhere else. There are other places with relatively lax gun control compared to, say, the UK. I'm, I'm British. I don't believe in the right to bear arms, but that's kind of irrelevant to this question, which is, why is it that, for example, Canada, where Kevin is from, has a significantly lower rate of sort of lone wolf shootings and school shootings than the US, when actually the gun laws are not all that different? It's not, if it's not about 
the gun laws, what, it is, what is it about the culture? And it's not a gun culture, it's, maybe it's a violent culture, I've got no idea. Why is it that Americans go and shoot people more than others? At the end of the day, uh, in other countries, Germany, America, uh, England, we have youngsters who are fed up with their teachers, are being not recognized, are not being taken care of. And they go get their father's car and crashes into the guys who hurt them or into their teachers who hurt them. So at the end of the day, it is not about the tool they're using, if they're using a gun, if they're using explosives, if they're using a car or whatever. It's about youngsters <coughs> going, getting out of control or not being taken care of, at, at my point, from my point of view. Panelists, responses, who wants to go first? You know, I think that at underlying this discussion um, is a question of trust. Um, and I think that the amazing thing about the, uh, the, the American state, the American history, the American Constitution, is that uh, it, here enshrined in law, we have um, uh, a society basis, uh, a society based on the idea that you can trust the people, that you can trust human beings more than you can trust their governments. And for me, you know, I, 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 guns scare me a little bit. I don't know how to shoot, although I think it'd be fun to learn. Um, but for me, the really, Im the, re the really important thing at the basis of this discussion is whom do you trust? Um, and I think the gun discussion basically just shows how, um, how uh, what a low down and pessimistic view we have of people, um, that, that we think that they are incapable of, well, we don't think that, they are in, that, they, that they're entitled to the right to have guns because guns are dangerous weapons, but we, they can't be trusted because they're too incompetent. Um, and so I, I think that that's something that, that's important to bear in mind. But the problem is, is that um, that lack of trust actually informs both sides of the gun debate. So the gun advocates are just as bad as <coughs> the gun opponents. I mean, you know, I always, sometimes I look at the stuff the NRA writes and I just think, oh, for God's sake, I could do better than that. And I don't want to do better than that particularly. But, but, um, but I, I think both, both sides of this discussion are, are degraded. I mean, why is it that in American society when the crime rate is is, is low, um, uh, that we trust, our, we have so little trust in our neighbors that we feel we can't sleep if we don't have a loaded gun in our nightstand. I mean, there is something, there's something uh, more profound going on here, uh, which is more than, uh, than about guns. It has to do with the way that people, um, people uh, interact with one another and trust one another. Nancy's comment just made me think that, um, and there have been several iterations of the question, why do Americans do this more than other people? Um, and it hopefully will also speak to the excellent, succinct, is this just shit happens question too. Um, we personalize risk, I think, more in America mm -hmm. than other countries do. It's, it's more, we're, we're a more heterogeneous population. Um, we, and this also speaks to the role of the state. So you do have um, individuals who, who are sort of fed this steady diet of, or consume, I should say, this steady diet of, of um, uh, television and, and internet media that, that as, as Tim pointed out, in, in, encourages this sense of personal risk. Um, there were interesting surveys after 9-11 about what individuals in America thought their personal likelihood of being killed by a terrorist was, and they wildly overestimated their risk of, of being a victim of terrorism. So we personalized this risk, and that is a cultural change. So there was the famous uh, um, steamboat uh, sinking in the 19th century that Mark Train wrote about, where the headline was, boat sinks, hundreds die, no one to blame. You would never see that headline in an American newspaper anymore. It would be, you know, lawyers hired, you know, litigation commences. So we do have, there's this sort of personalization of risk, and that comes out of a kind of rugged individualism, which is a good thing. That's a little bit of a dark side of rugged individualism. And then you have a state that once is becoming more involved in, 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 and more accepting of this idea that they should protect citizens from risk, hence safety warnings, regulations, the kind of thing that makes my libertarian knee jerk. Um, so it's not, violence is, is as old as time, but our capacity and our tolerance for risk has declined, I think, and that might explain some of the cultural differences. It's not just that we're mad or bad or angry and watch too much television, although that might also play a role. It's that we don't like to tolerate risk and we believe ourselves to be so important that we might be the victim of some horrible thing. 
this very good point about why would you not do something be simply because it's hard in a political sense. Well, that's why I didn't just give that one answer. I gave three, the practical, political, intellectual, because you have to weigh up, is it worth the attempt to get that one thing politically done? In the case of the things you listed, like tackling slavery, fighting segregation, it's worth it because they're moral issues. But because on the other two points, I think it isn't worth trying to restrict guns in that way, that's why it's not worth spending the political capital trying to do it. So that's sort of the answer to that. Um, the intellectual argument behind that, well, at the, at the center of the American Revolution is the principle of individual sovereignty, of individual self-reliance, of not having Either, to, either not having to be bullied by the government, by having a potential tyranny over you, but most importantly, being able to live somewhat separately from the government, being able to exist without it. That's kind of the core of American individualism. Um, it, it's a revolutionary experiment that's never gone away. And one thing that's quite unique about America is it is a country which is still defined by its historical revolution. There are very other, few other countries that have been like that. I mean, China's given up on its Maoism, thank goodness. The French Revolution has had several republics since then and is nothing like what they originally intended. America is still trying to stick to a historical template of behavior. And I think that's quite an extraordinary thing. It's one of the thing, reasons why I'm so attracted to it. The question of why it happens in America, well, this is part of the reason why I may well be um, sm pro small government, but I'm still on cultural, in cultural terms, conservative. Um, because culture does inform quite often how people choose to express their rage and what they choose to do. I think Hollywood has to take a great deal of responsibility for the existence, undeniably, of a fetishization of guns and a fetishizing of violence. I think that's undeniably true. It has to have something to do also with exploding patterns of illegitimacy in America. I mean, really, America's undergone a social revolution since the 1960s um, in, in terms of the structure of its family. It has to have something to do with those things. But also, I come back to this idea of fashions and trends. Again, I regret how glib that language is, but I think it is there. Um, a very good example of that is the New York power blackouts. Uh, there have been, what, three or four since the 1960s. Uh, when there was one in the 1950s, nothing happened. People simply uh, went home and stayed at home. Everything was very calm. When one happened in the early 70s, there were several days of rioting. Then when one happened in the uh, early noughties, again, people had street parties. And it was total calm. What was the difference between those different periods? Well, people's individual behavior was informed by some personal reading of the culture. Um, and finally, I agree with you on the risk point. Also, not only is American culture very risk averse, it's also uh, very alarmist, and it takes some pleasure in alarm too. A uh, wonderful example of that, I once saw a Fox News report uh, which said, boy brings gun to school in desperate bid to get attention. We have the exclusive footage and we'll be showing it to you later. <laughs> so he got the attention he wanted. And that's a lack of self-awareness and a lack of self-regulation uh, that sadly the American media has. Kevin, and can you answer this question about why Canadians are so, you know, easygoing and non-violent? First of all, because we're just really nice. <laughs> <laughs> we love everybody. Sorry. As they, they say, yes, a, a Mexican standoff, we, you'll know about a Canadian standoff is where two people stand at a door saying, no, after you. <laughs> <laughs> Go on for hours. No, I mean, I think, there, first of all, if you look at homicide rates, the United States does not have the highest homicide rates. What you can't no. do is correlate uh, gun ownership with homicide rates. So up until a few years ago, you had a higher gun ownership rate in Switzerland and yet Switzerland being one of the lowest countries uh, for, um, homo for homicide in, in, um, in the Western world. Uh, equally with Israel, um, Israel has a very, very high gun ownership rate, but it has a, a low uh, homicide rate. So you, you can't just take this correlation, these people own guns, therefore they're going to do that. Uh, I think it, it's very difficult to say exactly what the situation is between various different homicide rates. Um, the only thing you can say, when I, I read, for instance, Mother Jones occasionally comes out with this, and it, it comes out with a shock headline that uh, in areas where guns are more common, you will find more gun-related murders happening, and that is absolutely indisputable. Uh, but it does, it, like for instance, Britain has a higher homicide rate than, uh, say, um, oh, I'm trying to think of an example. Uh, but it certain, Britain has a higher homicide rate than, than areas where they have much higher uh, uh, um, 
ownership of weapons. What I would say is about that, first of all, in terms of school shootings, what's interesting is they do happen in other places, these, these mass homicides, and yet they're publicized much more. Uh, we know about it in the United States rather than in the places that they were published. One thing that I came across which was very interesting from uh, 1979 was in my hometown in Winnipeg, uh, there was a school shooting where a boy went in and shot two students uh, dead. And what I found fascinating was, A, um, they continued classes in the afternoon, which simply wouldn't happen. That, that school would be shut down and, and you know, the counselors would be uh, attacking the school and, and trying to counsel everybody for, for days. And that was a, it was a different response to the whole thing. But simply also that no lessons were learned. Nobody decided to do anything because of this. They said it was a, a tragedy. And it comes on to the, the shit happens question, um, which I agree with uh, about how succinct that was. It's excellent phrasing. But, I would say with that, don't forget that, that these massacres happen in Britain, in Whitehaven. Britain, the, the, the most, uh, you know, where weapons, you, you cannot own a shotgun, trust me, without going to the police station and filling out a form um, and having the police able to open your house at any time of the day or night to inspect that, you're, that not even the other people in your house have um, uh, access to the, the weapon that you have there. Uh, so Britain, with all of those ru rules, still has one of the worst horrific shootings uh, that has ever occurred. So Whitehaven uh, has happened. Also in Germany, we've had uh, uh, mass shootings happen. So they do occur other places. It's just simply that it tends to be given meaning inside the United States a lot more. And in terms of what do you do, well, I think you would do what anybody would, sh would do, which is to say, how can we prevent this from happening? And how could have we prevented that from happening? It's not to say you don't do that. It's simply to say that what you don't do is after Virginia Tech, you had all of these, uh, you know, and I agree with, with Nancy about the NRA, you know, the idea, well, let's arm everybody. Let's allow students to walk around with guns on their belts. That's not going to pre prevent that kind of thing. I mean, how many, how many people are, you know, when you go, everybody expecting a gunman and somebody moves their hand to their pocket, then bad things can happen. It's like. Uh, to prevent uh, hijacking, it was proposed that everybody be armed on a plane. And you think that would just not work. It's a disaster waiting to happen. So I think there's a time when you sit there and you say, you know what, we can't do anything about this. It is a tragedy and we, we cannot design out this tragedy. Uh, okay, I'm going to bring the uh, audience back out. One, uh, another thing to think about as well is the right of, this, of the state to bear arms. Starbucks recently issued a statement in the US that they d would prefer it if people didn't wear um, you know, exposed uh, firearms when they went into Starbucks to get their latte. Um, but they, uh, very importantly, they had the rider that it was okay for the police to do that because the police uh, carry firearms to protect the peace. So that's another thing that we've not uh, really looked at. But I'm going to take people, people need to be much quicker now because we're running out of time. It's been an intriguing discussion already. I mean, um, I absolutely agree with the lack of meaning, uh, both in so-called political acts at 9-11 and recently we saw Ken the Kenyan Moore attacks. Uh, and it absolutely means nothing. I mean, we can interpret and impose on that all sorts of ideas that we think mean something. But actually, what it really represents is a juvenile, I can't win any ideas. Uh, and so what I'm going to do is just do this very nihilistic act. And I think that, you know, it's the worst part of humanity in every respect. It's a travesty that anyone who thinks that that has anything to do with politics uh, thinks that, that that's relevant in any way. Um, but I, I am very much aware that, that that informs something else, which is that this notion that we, uh, about trust. And, you know, it, you talk about something like what happens in, in schools. And I believe you're more likely in America to get struck by lightning than to be shot in a classroom. And I think that we do need to say, when there's almost 250 million of weapons in the States, if it was the case, if you believe some people's discussion, everybody would be getting killed all the time by these mad, crazy, fat Americans who are stupid and just on a, on, on, on a, on a mad rage. And I think it speaks to, you know, Tim makes some very interesting points about self-reliance, rugged individualism, and not having the state involved. And that's absolutely the reason people can't stand it in parts of Europe and on the east and west coast in America. Because it absolutely is the opposite of what we're told is important today. We can't have rugged individualism because we are unfortunately all mad, bad and dangerous, not just a few people. 
You can't have a notion of self-reliance because obviously we're all toxic and poisonous. And if you trust on your fellow citizen that they'll do the right thing, then, then bad things are going to happen. And we should have the state intervening more and more because we can't be autonomous, uh, courageous uh, 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 citizens that can help one another, but we're likely to do very destructive things to one another. And in that kind of climate, where we live in a sort of an anxious moment, and the anxiety is about our fellow person. Now, I don't believe anyone in this room thinks that every human being is evil or nasty. We've all got friends, we all know people we like, and that type of thing. But when we start talking about people more generally, what ends up happening is that we think that they're really a bad bunch. And what's so insidious about, and I agree with the, 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 the Nancy's point, this is like a cultural, what's so insidious about the discussion about how the debate plays out in America and also uh, in Europe, is that it kind of really represents humans as a bad lot. I, I tell you, even my own family, I have a discussion about this, I come back and everyone wants to put the boot in about Americans. I, and I say, well, yeah, you know, my dad used to, used to go to a, a, a rifle range. I say, oh yeah, but that's him, he's fine. And that really speaks to, the, to, to that notion. And I, I would just say that I would support the idea of, of uh, the Second Amendment, actually internationally, because if people in Tahrir Square had had a few more guns, uh, maybe they would have been in a better position themselves too. Okay. I'm from Switzerland and I wanted to kind of um, discuss a little bit further this aspect of um, is that culture of guns. Um, and I wanted to maybe try to um, liaise this with the culture of war and maybe the culture of violence a bit, a bit more broadly because, for example, in Switzerland we have a culture of, I could say, like peace and, and neutrality and to some extent I wanted to ask the panel what do they think um, of this culture of guns maybe linked or in a more broad um, kind of vision of culture of domination, oppression or maybe even war. I have to say that um, I don't own a gun and uh, I never have owned a gun and probably never will own a gun. But so instead I have to come to this uh, intellectually loaded for bear because uh, I've been listening to the uh, discussion about you know guns and stuff and I just think it's uh, all, all, all a bit strange because I was, I was here about um, you know, the role of America and the American Revolution and all the rest of it and stuff. And it seems to me to be a slight uh, mistwisting of the context in which, in which the revolution happened. Um, uh, but also, just to talk about briefly about the NRA, I mean, the NRA is, is um, despite itself, um, aggrandizement is not a friend of Joe or indeed uh, Josephine Sixpack. It, it is actually uh, the armed, one, one of the armed wings of, of, the, of the establishment. But, um, in many ways, it's a sort of more deadly counter to uh, the liberal elite. Uh, the Second Amendment, which is often quoted uh, by, uh, you know, by various people who are, are who I feel like, pro-gun, gun like, say, um, lobbies and stuff, uh, usually the NRA itself and obviously various militias, uh, understand that that's, that's only a bit of the, of the Constitution uh, that they know. And uh, they quote it, they quote it out of context. The context, obviously, in which the Second Amendment came about is because that when George Washington started, you know, they, they obviously had, had a no-standing army, so they had to get the quickest amount of people um, under arms. And of course, you know, the best way to do that, because each individual had a squirrel rifle, that was the best way you know, to get them together. Um, I think we can agree that uh, despite the fact uh, that America has, um, a, has a communist Muslim president, nonetheless, you know, uh, the idea you know, that they're going to be taken over um, you know, uh, the idea that the state is going to be overthrown and so therefore in the meantime you know, people need to be um, armed to the MT, I, you know, I think it's absurd if anything else, I think it shows a lack of faith in the American people and indeed in the American uh, political process. Hi, so as a middle class European, I only, go, only know guns from television, so I know not much about them, but I'm of course um, against any regulation for gun ownership, for all the reasons you've mentioned. But on the other hand, I also know from television that not all guns are the same. You already mentioned assault rifles, that you mentioned, you mentioned guns as tools, you mentioned guns as tools. So, you know, you don't go duck hunt, hunting with anthrax or so. Um, but I think, it's, it's, um, this goes against all my beliefs, but um, this is a really good question because is there maybe like a sort of fetishization of handguns, assault rifles, guns that are unlike horses, only designed to kill people? You know, they are 
you know, the, 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 I always imagine the episode of The Simpsons where Homer goes around with his new owned handgun as the solution for everything. He shoots the television on and off and the lights. So this has become his solution to solve all problems in the world. So is there maybe a problem with maybe happening in the last 10 years or so that more and more Americans believe that handguns are a solution to a lack of political will? Next year, we will be having a session on the benefits of horseback riding for creating the rugged individual. And Kevin will be speaking against the motion. Kerry Dingle from World Bites. Quick point. Back to the meaning thing, which I think Alan Miller has addressed as well. I just wanted to ask Kevin, because you're saying we shouldn't... There's this tendency to read into these shootings after the fact and to give them meaning. But isn't there... There is meaning in the sense if you look at, not school shootings, say, but you look at Boston, which to me was like the film Four Lions in reality, in a reality sort of chasing film. The Woolwich murder, or if you look at the mall incident recently, and so on, sort of terrorist attacks, etc. A profound narcissism, a profound nihilism, very anti-Western, people who've never been part of anything in the world that's been intervened in, claiming they represent them. And I'm not saying they're political acts, but I'm saying there is a political context that we have to take into account. And, and we can't counter that anti-Western, anti-consumption, anti-human outlook with gun control, obviously. I just wanted your thoughts on that. I think there's been some reference, uh, especially from Tim, to the, the American Revolution and the historical background to gun ownership, which I think is very useful. But I, uh, I think, following Kerry's remarks, it's not at all to justify the acts to recognise that with National Security Council uh, Report uh, 68, published in 1950, the American state entered uh, a period of the Cold War which was extremely forceful in terms of its quote-unquote cultural impact. And I put it to you that if you're living in a state which is defined as a national security state, where every foreign policy issue is actually a domestic policy issue, yes. you've conducted wars in Iraq twice, in Afghanistan and elsewhere, then um, it's not to think that Americans are violent or too influenced, as Tim, I think, wrongly suggested by Hollywood, to say that the uh, more recent events which have contoured American culture are to do with the Cold War, not just to do with the American Revolution. Let me just say that two things that Kevin was far too um, modest about, that he wrote about in his book, which is that the anti-gun legislation in the United States was pioneered by Ronald Reagan against the Black Panther movement, and uh, was also pioneered um, by uh, other right-wingers, uh, pr principally Nixon. This is all got done to death in Kevin's book. And I think anybody who wants to say that uh, done to death, I'll, I'll rephrase that. But uh, it's, um, it's a very, it off the back cover. Very good book. Very good book. If you know anybody who's in favour of gun control in the United States has to explain to me why they would side with Ronald Reagan against the Black Panthers, because I would always side with the Black Panthers, even though I didn't quite agree with them. I agree with people like um, Kerry and Alan. Uh, yeah, I think it was Alan. That. Um, individuals should have the freedom of choice and that they have the capacity within themselves to think that, okay, you know, this gun isn't going to shoot another human being, but I'll just use it as a tool to kill a deer or whatever. But I, I really struggle to accept the notion that anti-Western terrorists um, are nihilistic. I think that they do have a political st statement to make. They might not identify um, themselves as citizens of whatever country in the West that they come from, and they identify themselves with... Um, wars and insurgencies that are going on in their home countries in Africa or Asia or whatever. But, so I know I kind of really don't believe that they are nihilistic and I think there is a point to be made. Obviously I don't agree with them, but yeah. Okay, I'm, um, I'm going to bring the panellists in briefly to, to sum up. Um, just so that people know, we will be continuing this, this discussion on November the 5th in New York. And you will be able to watch the debate on our website at um, nysalon.org. So, uh, Tim, let's start with you. Yeah, thank you. Um, on the point about resistance to state power, I mean, the, the point was made back there that um, realistically, Barack Obama's not going to try and take all the guns, socialize everything, etc. No, of course he's not going to do that. Um, and I don't think, I, I think 99.999% of Americans don't believe that. Unfortunately, there is a small group that do. 
uh, but the vast, vast majority do not. The point about a constitution is it's about principle. And the facts and the practicalities of law flow from those principles. Doesn't mean that the principle <coughs> becomes reality. Doesn't mean it actually happens. And it is the principle that the individual can exist without the state defending them, or it is the principle that the state, that the individual could resist the state if the state became too powerful. That is the principle from which the rest of law and culture can flow. Now, actually, that has had some political reflection in the history of the United States. Native Americans were oppressed by the state. Uh, if you live in the Deep South in the 1950s and 60s, uh, African Americans were oppressed by a state apparatus. This is not just about individual racist groups oppressing black people, this is actually about state law and the state police doing that. Which is why, again, so many civil rights activists joined gun clubs, uh, supported the NRA, and it's why the Black Panthers armed themselves. I, I think that created an escalation of political violence that was in and of itself uh, very unhealthy and unhelpful and had to be corrected in some way, but that's the root of why that happened. I also really want to agree with the point about foreign policy. Um, I think that the principal starting point um, when it comes to how a state behaves should be rejection of violence. I think when the state can behave violently, that of course has, not only does it lead to oppression, but of course it ends up framing the culture of the society around it. And the reality is, is that in the last few years under this Nobel Peace Prize winning president, <laughs> there has been a surge in troop numbers in Afghanistan, and there have been thousands of deaths from drone strikes. America is a highly militarized society, especially see if you go to Washington or, or Virginia. It's an astonishingly, frighteningly militarized society. But to wind you up now, it has an aggressive foreign policy, and I have no doubt that that in some way ends up shaping the violence of its culture. Christine, you're up. Okay, I live in Washington, D.C. I encourage you to visit. It's not that scary. It's, <laughs> there are lots of barricades, more than when I first moved there. But um, I actually want to pick up on something Tim said about the Constitution, because we didn't get to talk about the American Constitution much. But it, it speaks to your point. Um, and I don't think you meant it this way, but it came off... Again, my American knee jerked when you said, oh, the people who support the Second Amendment probably don't even know what the rest of the Constitution says. On the contrary, you will find, so Tea Party groups, which are often, um, you know, they're, they're, they can get extreme. They regularly have constitutional meetings where they sit around in, in their homes with other Tea Party members and they read the Constitution and they debate it. And this is, this is something they do for pleasure, for fun. We have, you know, we have a National Constitution Day. We have a beautiful museum in Philadelphia called the National Constitution Center, which is devoted to the Constitution. Never underestimate an American's love for their Constitution. It's this living document. Every year, the Supreme Court debates its meaning. Um, it, it's, it's central to what it means to be American, and it's the, the thing, along with the revolution, from which flows these principles that Tim was mentioned. So I think seeing the gun debate in those terms might help you know, give us a broader uh, sense of it. Thank you. Kevin. Yeah, just on that, I mean, I think, um, oh, before I go on to that, duck hunting with anthrax. If somebody's looking for a band name, so <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think, um, just, just on that kind of question about the history, because I think it is useful to, to highlight the history, the approach that the Founding Fathers used was not what should we allow, it was what should we restrict. And that's the way people should look at the whole uh, gun control issue, is why would we res restrict this item that people have in their houses? And it's, it very much annoys me when I go back through uh, historical records, uh, one of which has been found to be plagiarized, and so we can happily ignore it, but uh, which question this whole attachment to Americans with guns. The real question came is, uh, why would we restrict anybody from having that? The history of gun controls uh, emerged first in the South against African Americans, and those were the first gun controls came. The first national gun control, New York, 1911, the Sullivan Act, was enacted because it was worried about Sicilians and other uh, terrible immigrants that had come in and were violent. Uh, even in Britain, it was 1919 when the most significant gun controls <coughs> came in, worried about the Irish, uh, the 1916 rebellion, and also returning proletariat soldiers with guns uh, didn't seem a good idea at the time of the Russian Revolution. That's why these things come. They are elite. It's a, it's a real top-down kind of thing. So that's how I think you should think about it. Just, on the interesting question of carry and also touch upon over here, uh, it's, I've, I've had a big debate back and forth uh, from last Monday about Columbus Day. And what struck me is how many Americans 
hate Columbus and how this, this great attack on Columbus, oh, he's a sex abuser, he's this, he's that, you know, uh, all sorts of sort of things. And I found I was the lone non-American uh, defending Columbus uh, to all my friends. And, and I think what that reflects is, is a sort of attitude towards history that reflects an attitude towards America at this moment anyway. It, that is the sort of uh, orthodoxy now, is that everything America did in the past, and hence anything it does now, is actually wrong and immoral and terrible. Um, and uh, I think a, a good dose of history would, all, would help to sort of um, um, actually correct that. Thank you. Nancy. Well, I'm really glad you mentioned Switzerland, um, because uh, Switzerland should be part of every discussion. But no. uh, 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 it, the, the reason is, it's, I think it's, kind of, it's interesting, because one of probably the most notorious uh, shooting incident in New York City in the 1980s was when a man named Bernard Goetz, mm -hmm. a Swiss national, was riding on the subway and uh, was uh, felt threatened by some black youth. Uh, and shot them all, um, and, uh, and and it's very interesting because uh, because I I happen to have a lot of Swiss friends, um, and uh, my my son's god godparents are from Switzerland, so I've spent some time there. And the thing you really notice when you go to Switzerland is that there are very clear expectations, like you know you pay for your ticket, and you don't you know you don't get on the 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 bus without paying because you know by God you have. It's, it's the honor system. You don't break that. I mean, I don't know if that's still true, but or there was the terrible piano incident when Simone played the piano on a Sunday, and the neighbors all came around to explain to her that this was unacceptable. Um, and uh, and uh, I mean, I think I think what it shows is that when you have um, or, or what, what struck me is is kind of funny is that here's this Bernard Getz person who goes from a society where there are very clear expectations to a society that is, is quite a bit more ad atomized, where people, you know, not only are there not clear expectations about what you do, but they're contested all the time. Um, and uh, uh, and uh, people don't really know how to talk to one another particularly well. And I think one of the, the genuine problems that underlies uh, perhaps some of the gun, gun incidents that we have is that Americans are, you know, pretty incompetent when it comes to um, sorting out disputes. So um, an example of this is uh, the dreaded rise of the Homeowners Association, um, which is uh, all over America, people are really afraid to talk to their neighbors. You know, and, and you know, if you if you follow advice forums, um, which is my guilty pleasure, you know, that you get my neighbor's dog is shitting in the yard. Should I call the police? You know, and, and or, or you know, or should I call the homeowners or is it owners association because I don't really want to get into help all with them, but just I, shoot them. Well, <laughs> well, see, this is the, well, here's the thing: is that I think there's, I, I think there's a, there's an element of instability. So you know, some of the most tragic shooting incidents are this one in Louisiana where um, a Japanese exchange student dressed up for Halloween um, got the wrong address, uh, went to a door, the man um, behind the door said freeze the Japanese exchange student didn't understand, and so the man shot him. You know, and it's like, well, why, you know, just, just that you can go from kind of zero to shooting someone is actually indicative of a, a bigger problem with American um, society, which uh, I actually think is, is repeated at the, Ameri at the level of politics, um, and, and which is, you know, what the culture war in some ways is all about. Okay, thank you all for coming. Please thank our speakers.